<laughs> anyway, he's from Hartsell, Alabama. Anybody ever heard of Hartsell, Alabama? Wow. Just outside Decatur, would you welcome tonight Brother Michael Mason. Thank you, the one Alabama fan. Thank you for that. There you are. I hear you. Well, it is good to be here. I don't know exactly where I am, but I'm glad to be here. Have you ever had that feeling? <laughs> Me and my little GPS lady had three fights on the way down here. It's the first time I'd ever heard the little GPS lady use profanity. She cleared her throat and huffed three times all the way from the Holiday Inn to Milldale Baptist Church, I guarantee you. It is a joy to be here. Thank you. I know it says Baptist on the sign. This ain't no Baptist church. This is Baptecostal, is it? <laughs> Baptist with a kick. <clears throat> Y'all got something most Baptists don't have. It's a good thing. I'm privileged to be here. Go ahead and open up your Bible. Revelation chapter 3, it's a very familiar passage, but I'd never preached it until just recently. I was intrigued with verse number 20. And even though I'd quoted it, thought about it, used it from time to time, I'd never preached this passage, never really put much thought into exactly what was going on in concerning the church of the Laodiceans. But we'll think about that tonight. And I want you to think with me about the idea Jesus is at the door. That's a good thought. Jesus is at the door. And we'll begin at verse number 14 of Revelation 3. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Some translations say spit, some say vomit. There it is on the screen. I will reject you. I will spit you out of my mouth because you say, I'm rich. I become wealthy, I'm increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. But you do not know. If I underline things in my Bible, I'd underline those three words, they're key. You do not know. They didn't know their condition. They didn't know that they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Verse 18 other words, I think you ought to underline, he says, I counsel you to buy from me. I'd circle the word me. He says, come to me. I have everything that you need. Come to me. I'm the one that can save you. Come to me. I'm the one that can help you. Come to me. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now look what he says next. Therefore, be zealous. They had lost their zeal. Be zealous for me. Be zealous for the things of God. Be zealous. You've lost your zeal. Be zealous and repent. Now here it is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Is it a good thought tonight that Jesus is at the door? And while I have many thoughts when I read this passage, the one that leaped off the pages to me some time back when I began to study it afresh was simply this. He's as near as the other side of the door. 
We're talking about a church. We're not talking about a community gathering. We're not talking about a civic organization. We're not even talking about a cultic gathering where their theology is unusual and weird. They don't have strange practices. They're the church. They are a church. They're involved in preaching the Word of God. They're involved in teaching the Word of God. They're involved in missions. They're singing praises to God. They're doing everything that a church ought to do, but Jesus is on the porch. Jesus is on the other side of the door. I don't know about you, but that bothers me. Does it bother anybody else? And I wonder today, as I preach all over the Southeast in particular, I wonder how often I'm involved in church where Jesus is on the outside. I wonder how often I'm involved in worship where Jesus is really not even involved in the mix. Because here's what I know. Most of us are good at what we're doing. Most of us are pretty good at preaching the word. Most of us are pretty good at singing songs that honor God. Most of us have been in church all of our life. And we could do it with our eyes closed, even without the presence of God. We're dead and don't even know it. They knew not of their condition. Man, this passage is full. Of illustrations. The most vivid to begin with is lukewarm. And he says three times, you're not cold, you're not hot. You're not cold, you're not hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you're not cold, you're not hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, this is what the Lord was saying. And they knew exactly the vividity of the illustration that he was sharing. Now, because theologians know more than I and people who've studied much longer than I share this information, it becomes vivid to me as well as it did to them. Cold water was pumped into Colossae, from Colossae to Laodicea. And by the time it reached Laodicea, it wasn't cold, it was cool. Hot water was pumped in from Hierapolis. And by the time it arrived at Laodicea, it wasn't hot, it was warm. And so what he was saying is, your worship to me is like a warm glass of lemonade. It's like a cool cup of coffee. It is distasteful and I will reject it. I wonder today, is God receiving our worship? I wonder today, is God receiving my preaching? I wonder today, is God pleased with what we're doing? Could it be that we're going through the motions? Could it be like, that like Laodicea, we know not of our condition and just how critical it is? It leads to the second vivid illustration. I will spew you out of my mouth. I will reject you. I will vomit. I will reject you. It's not acceptable. And I wonder tonight, as we gather to pray, as we gather to preach and offer praises to God, is he receiving what we offer him? Or is it rejected because of our lukewarm condition? Have we gathered to worship tonight knowing that there is unconfessed sin in our lives? Have we gathered to worship knowing that there is active adultery even within the body of Christ? Have we gathered to worship while this very day we've used profanity? Have we gathered to worship knowing that there's sin in our life that we've not confessed and we ask God to receive our worship in that kind of condition? He says, I'm not going to receive it. It leads to that third vivid illustration. I stand at the door and knock. I don't see a militant Savior standing there. I don't see an angry Jesus. I see a Savior who's patient but he's also persistent. Behold, I stand. It's a loving Savior. He's kind and full of mercy and grace, and he's knocking at the door of the church. The question is, will we let him in? I mean, how many of us preachers before have preached without the power of God on our life? Well, I let him into what I'm doing. Do I hear the knock of God? Do I hear the voice of God? What is it that God may be saying to me? Where is it in my life that I've rejected him? Where is it in my life that I've become dry and routine and predictable? Where is it that I'm not cold? I'm not hot. Where is it that I'm just stagnant and lukewarm? He's on the other side of the door. That's close. Now, when I was a boy, 
raised up in North Alabama at home during the summers with my mother. She didn't work outside the home, me and my sister at home during the summer time. We hid from time to time from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Have you ever hid from a Jehovah's Witness? Some of y'all looking spiritual like you've never done it. You ought to try it. It's kind of fun. Back then, before minivans, they traveled in station wagons. And we had a neighbor across the road. I mean, I lived out in the country. I sure enough did. And when we seen the Jehovah's Witnesses across the load un a road unloading, Mother gathered us in, shut the door, uh, pulled the drapes, turned off the TV, and we hunkered down for the invasion of the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> now, I can understand hiding from the Jehovah's Witnesses, but I don't understand this. For whatever reason, I never did really ask my mother about this. For whatever reason, we also hid from the Avon lady. <laughs> you ever hid from an Avon lady? Now, we bought Avon from time to time. It's what people out in the country did. We didn't go to town much. We bought Avon. But mother didn't like this lady for some reason. And when she began to come up our driveway, which was about a quarter of a mile long, we again hunkered down as if she was a Jehovah's Witness. Pulled the curtains, shut the door, locked it, turned off the TV. My sister's on the couch, quiet as a mouse. Mother's positioned where she can see through the crack in the curtains and keep an eye on the Avon lady and at the same time point at me and threaten my life if I say a word. <laughs> and we hear her car pulling up the drive. It's a gravel drive, and you can hear the gravel crunching. We hear the door shut. We hear the heels on the sidewalk. She's on the porch. About that point is where mother gives me the stink eye. Did your mother give you the your mother give you the stink eye? Mother could raise one eyebrow. The other one would stay still. When her left eyebrow got up in the edge of her hair, she meant business. It would shoot off her head sometimes. And so she's knocking. Now, I want you to hear this. I'm trying to make a point. And I'm thinking, doesn't she know we're not here? <laughs> no, that's the point. She knew we were there. She knew we were inside. She knew what was going on. She knew. Now, don't miss this. I think it's important. Jesus knew they were in there. He knew what they were doing. He knew that they were not cold. He knew they were not hot. He knew the condition they were in, and he knocked. And I wonder today, is God knocking at the door of your heart? Is God knocking at the door of your life? Is God knocking at the door of your family? Is God knocking at the door of our worship? Is God knocking at the door of all that we do Call praise to God? Is God knocking at the door of my preaching? Is God knocking at the door of all that we do called missions? Is God involved in what we're doing? Or is he on the front porch as near as the other side of the door? I was in Sunday school at our home church just a few weeks ago, and I learned something about a man I, I had no idea. He's in his early 70s, and in the conversation that morning about forgiveness, he said, I spent the better part of 45 years of my life drunk, he said. He said, I started drinking when I was around 15, and he said, I spent the better part of my life drunk. He said, I drank in the morning. He said, I drank throughout the day. He said, I would drink at night. <clears throat> he said, I would drink before I went to bed. He said, and the first thing I would do in the morning when I woke up was I would finish the beer that I'd been drinking the night before. He said, I drank all the time. He said, I got to the point that being drunk was normal. He said, I had to get sober before I realized 
how drunk I'd been. Some people have to get saved before they realize how lost they've been. Laodicea is going to have to get revived before they're going to realize how dead they've been. He said, I didn't know what sober felt like. I spent over 40 years drunk. He said, I went to work drunk. I lived drunk. I ate supper drunk. I went to ball games drunk. He said, I did everything about half drunk. He said, I didn't know what sober felt. He said, I had to get sober before I realized the condition, how drunk I'd been. Man, I'm just convinced of this. Most churches don't have revival because they don't want revival. If real revival ever came, it would look more like a resurrection of the dead because we're cold. If we're not cold, I can guarantee you this, we're not leaning toward hot. If we're lukewarm, we're leaning toward cold. We're cool in the presence of God. We've lost the hotness of our worship. We've lost the hotness of our prayer life and our Bible study. The Bible is dead and meaningless to us. We have no prayer life. Our worship is routine and predictable. We lost a passion for the things of God. If we're lukewarm, and we may very well be, we're not leaning toward hot. We're leaning toward cold. Amen. He says you are neither. Let's look at the scriptures quickly. He says you are neither cold or hot. It's in verse 15 and 16. So I make up a word there. And the word that I want to describe them is with simply this. The condition of neitherness. Neitherness. And maybe that's where we are today. We are marked by our neitherness. They were not cold, but they were not hot. They were not ungodly, but they weren't godly. They weren't unfaithful necessarily, but they sure weren't faithful. They weren't unrighteous, but they weren't righteous. They didn't hate God. <laughs> My goodness, they would never say we hate God. But they sure didn't love God. Neither. Now, there's two or three things, at least in the great state of Alabama, and I don't know how it is down here, but in the great state of Alabama, there's a couple of things you can't be neither in regard to. You can't be neither Republican or Democrat. Is that the way it is down here? You're one or the other. I mean, the audacity of someone to say, I'm neither. Well, shame on you for being a neither. And I would say today that our churches are full of neithers. That is, we are neither cold nor hot. We are absolutely uncommitted. We are in no man's land. We've lost our passion for the things of God, and we are tilted toward cold. And in the great state of Alabama, you know the other neither. Are you Alabama or Auburn? Oh, I'm neither. You've got to be kidding me. If you say, I am neither Alabama or Auburn, in the state of Alabama, you take a chance of getting throat punched. Is anybody with me on that? Where's my Alabama fan at? Right in the throat. You can't be neither. If you're going to be neither, there's somebody in the state of Alabama that will decide for you. <laughs> the last time I preached for Dennis over here at Greenville Springs, it was at a men's conference. I'd been home I'd been home a week, and my boy at the time was around eight or nine years of age. He came in the house, and he said, Daddy, why is there an LSU tag on your truck? <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I said, oh, son, you're seeing things. That, that's an Alabama tag. He said, no, it's purple and gold. Somebody at that church over there had the audacity to put a LSU tag over my Alabama tag. Can you believe that? At that men's retreat, I had to sleep between purple and gold sheets. The shower curtain was purple and gold, and they had draped the toilet in purple and gold paper. One of those memories you'd love to forget. Anybody with me on that? You can't be neither. 
They were neither cold nor hot. And the Lord says, I wish, I wish you were cold or hot. James Emery White says that we are living in the day of the rise of the nuns. Not the rise of the N-U-N-S, nuns, but the rise of the N-O-N-E-S, nuns. He said we're living in a day when statistical information is gathered and maybe the question is asked, what religion are you affiliated with? And maybe there's the question Protestant, maybe Roman Catholic, maybe Jewish, maybe other, and maybe none. We're living in a day with the rise of the nuns. No one's willing to affiliate. No one's cold or hot. Everyone's just somehow comfortably in the middle. And God says, I would rather you be cold than lukewarm. And I would certainly rather you be hot than lukewarm. Are you a part of the nuns? Are you a part of the unaffiliated? Are you a part of the uncommitted? Are you a part of the neithers? Am I marked by neitherness? I'm not all that bad. But I'm not all that good. It's not that I don't believe the Bible. It's just that I, I, I'm not necessarily committed to what it says. It's not that I don't pray. It's just that I just can't seem to find the time. I'm a neither. Are you with me? <laughs> well, amen. amen. I don't claim to know everything, but I preach in a different church every week. And too much of what we do is stale and stagnant and predictable. I wonder what would happen. I hear prayers prayed sometimes, and, and I open one eye, and I think, Dear God, what if you answered that prayer? I hear prayers prayed, Oh God, we pray for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, Are you sure? I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm just convinced we haven't seen it. My buddy, Junior Hill, who lives just a few miles down the road, he says he's only been involved in maybe eight or ten real moves of God in all the years that he's preached. He said, I'd like to see one more. Man, just to be in a move of God, to know his power, to walk out saying God was in our midst, to know that God did something that, that cannot be explained in any other words than by saying, God did it. But we're a part of the nuns. Not only are they marked by neitherness, they're marked by what I believe is numbness. They think they're rich and increased with goods and they don't need anything. But they know not. Oswald Chambers talks about being comfortable, but yet having no peace. Being comfortable. Man, I like comfort, don't you? I like a comfortable car. I like a comfortable lazy boy at home. I like central heat and air. I enjoy being comfortable. I enjoy a comfortable church. But just because I have comfort doesn't mean I have peace. We can be comfortable and yet not know the peace of God. And maybe that's where we are in our churches. My Lord, I'm in some of the nicest buildings. We are so comfortable. Look at us. We're on the screens. We're big shots. We've arrived. But we, do we even know the peace of God in all that we claim as comfortable? I like big screens, by the way. And I like wonderful music. I sure do. I like it all. But could it be that Oswald's right? That in the midst of all our, our comfort and conveniences, we don't know the peace of God? We are troubled in our spirits. We are holding grudges. We are bitter and angry and jealous and envious. We are unforgiving with one another. There's strife within the body of Christ. We're not cold. We're not hot. We're just lukewarm. And we are numb to our condition. <laughs> Here's what I know. If God doesn't get involved in what I do behind the pulpit, it's just a speech. And I like your building. But without the presence of God, it's just a big fancy barn. 
and it would hold a lot of hay. But oh, what if the Spirit of God filled it? Oh, what if there was a mighty rushing wind? Oh, what if it came true what we sing about? Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire. From, are you kidding me? Or do we even want that? A few years ago, I helped coach my son's football team when they were 10, 11 years old. We gathered them all around one night. The coaches, I was one of the assistants. The head coach said, guys, get together. We're going to teach you some new things tonight. We're going to teach you some things you don't know. We're going to teach you some things you've never heard about. Gather around, guys. It's like herding cats. You ever help coach little 8, 10-year-old boys? And so we got them all gathered around, and the coach is saying, we're going to teach you some things tonight that's, that you don't know. One little boy raised his hand. Coach. Coach called on him. Coach. What is it that we don't already know? <laughs> it's a pretty legitimate question. Coming from a 9 or a 10-year-old kid that's been raised on PlayStation, been raised on John Madden football, whatever year, he knows how to call offenses and defenses As nine, at 9 years old. What do we not already know? I wonder if our churches are there. I wonder if we think we know it all. We've experienced it all. We've felt it all. We've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. What do we not know? Man, I'm here to tell you, you've got to know this. There's more that we don't know than we do know. There's more that we've never experienced than we have experienced. There's more that we've never felt than we have felt. We're lukewarm. We're lukewarm. I was born too late. I'm a 63 model. I talked to Junior from time to time. He's a 36 model. Man, I'd like to have got in on some of that. I'd like to have preached here a few years ago with the likes of Manly Beasley. Wouldn't that have been something? He had something most Baptists don't have. Man, he had a faith. Ron Dunn, men of God, they walked with God, knew the power of God. The fire of heaven fell down. Revival meetings happened. Folks were begging to get in. The windows were open to the building so folks could hear the word of God. They were not cold. They were not lukewarm. There seemed to have been a passion a few years ago. Numbness. Like calluses on your hands. Like cataracts on your eyes. We can't feel his presence like we did we can't see him work like we once did. The third word, there's many that I could choose from this next list of words, but I've talked about neitherness and numbness. I want to talk for just a minute about nakedness. Yeah, he says, you're poor, wretched, blind, miserable, and naked. I just want to say that I believe that Laodicea was shameless. They had lost their shame. I was in a revival meeting some time back, actually, where other preachers were preaching also, and one of the preachers talked about and preached about how that we've lost our shout. Boy, it was a great sermon, talking about how we've lost our joy, how we've lost our passion, how we've lost our praise for the things of God, but over and over and over, he reiterated, we've lost our shout. And I'm just convinced that many of us have lost our shout because we've lost our shame. Nothing is, is indecent anymore. We're not ashamed of our nakedness. The Lord says, buy from me. I'm going to give you clothing, raiment, white raiment. It'll cover the shame of your nakedness. Could it be that we're not knowing and sensing the power and the touch and the presence of God in our churches today because we've lost our shame. We've lost our ability to blush. Nothing is indecent anymore. You can say what you want to, but the things we watch on TV have rubbed off on us. And the country and rap and such as that music 
that we allow to flood into our homes, it has had an effect on us. If you listen to a regular diet of top country music, you are allowing the devil to influence your thinking. That it's okay to get drunk. It's certainly okay to be involved in as much immorality as you want. And it's okay to smear God's name. I'm telling you, it's never been okay and it never will be. And God was calling Laodicea to revival. God was calling Laodicea to recognize their shame, to realize that there were some things that were still decent. There were some things that were right, but they had rejected the way of purity and they had gone the way of shamelessness. And like the old story of the emperor's new clothes, he hired a couple of swindlers to make him a new set of clothes. They convinced him that the cloth that they were showing him, which actually was not cloth at all, was so fine, the paupers and the rich, the paupers and the poor of the community couldn't see it, only the wealthy and well-to-do. So he said, make me a suit of clothes. So they made him a suit of clothes out of nothing, pretending that it was the finest material he'd ever seen in his life. He put it on, and he began to parade in the streets. And the audacity of one little boy to cry out above the crowd as the emperor parades by in his chariot wearing nothing. The little boy cries out, but he's not wearing anything. Somebody today has to point out the obvious. The church is in a mess. We need a revival. We need the touch of God. We may not be cold, but we're not hot. We are complacent. We've lost our passion for the things of God. I'm here to tell you, my friend, I love the meal tonight. I love the music tonight. I believe the presence of God is here. I texted someone just before the service. In fact, I sent Brother Junior a text. I said, you're not going to believe it. There's more people here than I've seen at church in a long time. God's up to something. I said, I'm excited to see what he might do. What he might not do because of our lukewarm condition. Here's the last word. I've talked about their neitherness, numbness, nakedness. But verse 20 is about his nearness. He gives them a rebuke. It's a word of chastening. It's a word of correction. But thank God for verse 20. It's a word of mercy and grace. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. A preacher friend of mine called me a few weeks ago, and it got me to thinking about this sermon. He said, what do you think about Revelation 3.20? And I said, I don't know. I sure have quoted it a lot. I sure have thrown it in at opportune times in my preaching, but I don't know that I've ever preached on it. And so I had a could have been a driving to do that day. And I began to think about Revelation 3.20. It's an illustration. It's an illustration. That's all it is. It shows us a Savior that's not going to barge through the door against our will. It shows us a Savior who's standing and He's patiently yet persistently pursuing us. And yes, I know we're to be like David after the heart of God, pursuing the things of God. But what I saw is simply an illustration. But it's also an indication. It's an indication that he's not, that he's not angry. He's not the Islamic Savior. He's not a militant God. Amen? Amen? He's full of love and mercy and compassion. God so loved. God so called. God desires that we be holy. It's an indication that he desires to save us if we're lost. It's an indication that he desires to cleanse us if we're guilty. It's an indication that he wants to make us free if we're captive. It's an indication that he wants to revive us if we're dead. It's an, it's an illustration. That's all it is. Don't over, don't over theologize that verse. And it's an indication that he cares. But most of all, it is an invitation. He stands and he waits. Thank God 
that he stands at the door. Thank God he's as near as the other side. If I'm lost, he's that close. If I'm a part of a church that's lost its zeal and passion for God, Brother Dennis, I have no idea what goes on here on a typical Sunday. But I know what's going on in most churches on a typical Sunday. I'm afraid in too many places he's on, he's on the other side of the door. Would you pray with me? Jesus is at the door. He's not barging his way in. He's not coming in against our will. He's just not going to barge into my life. But if I will seek the Lord while he can be found, if I will call on his name while he's near, if I will cry out to Jesus, Lord Jesus, I hear your voice. God, I, I know what it is that I need to do. God, I know what it is I need to change. God, I know where you're sending me. God, I know what it is you're leading me to do. God, I hear your voice. Now open the door, friend. Let him come in. Maybe for the first time or maybe for another time to let him renew and revive and restore. Speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Revive us already. We pray these things in Jesus' name.